Hey everyone, Genome here, coming at you with the next episode in my interview series. Uh, this series takes a look at people who do interesting and or extraordinary things. Uh, the goal of these interviews, though, is not just to focus on the thing that the person is known for, but a little also on the person himself. So today I am uh, joined by something of a rising star here, especially in the fan film department out there, um, none other than Mr. Uh, Vincent DeSanti. How are we doing this evening? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Genome? Oh man, if I was any better, I'd be somewhere else, right? But... Um, mm. Please excuse this disgusting <laughs> no mark on my nose. I had like nose surgery today, so the, uh, the I, dermatologist. I just came out of uh, of a <laughs> dental thing that they had to like numb my mouth. So I'm just kind of, like I'm just starting to feel my mouth again. <laughs> but I kind of got a little rocky thing going on with my lower lip, but I can still talk. So I'm we'll fine. pretend it's big league chew or something, right? Yeah, so, I just got a big dip in. <laughs> so uh, Vincent here is he's a man of many hats uh, as far as filmmaking goes. He's a writer, uh, director, producer, actor. He he does basically every job you can do uh, in, in the business. So. Uh, he is most well known as of late for his award winning uh, fan film, Never Hike Alone. It's an amazing thing, and I will put links to it below. Make sure to go watch it if you haven't seen it. It's uh, one of the best hours you'll ever spend on YouTube, that's for dang sure. Uh, now, you're involved with the Womp Stomp films. Is that your baby, or what is Womp Stomp to you? Uh, yeah, Womp Stomp's my, my little baby. Um, I had a, I don't know, it's been this funny nickname that I've had for a long time for all my social media accounts. It was just Womp Stomp. So I usually to post photography and little shorts and things like that. When I decided to make a little something a little bit more substantial, we came up with Womp Stomp Films just because it seemed to fit. And it was a silly name. And we, you know, we really didn't think about it at the time. And it was over time that like Womp Stomp, our identity grew, our teamwork grew, our just our overall aesthetic grew as like a, a team. And so, you know, I'd say about the time Never Hike Alone came out, we knew exactly who Womp Stomp Film was. And since then have worked on developing it even further, you know, adding members to our team, um, you know, continuing to recruit, continuing to go out and, and find, you know, young independent uh, filmmakers, you know, whether they're cameramen or, you know, sound people or lighting or effects and all that. And just, you know, creating a good base for, me as a creator and a you know on the producing side being able to put a lot of talented people together in the same room to create cool projects and then when i'm making my own projects all those people are available to work on my stuff so it's a cool little like community that we have and we all work on each other's projects we all help each other out we all lend a hand you know we call it i call it the ride or die crew um, these are the people that don't get paid. They don't ask for money. They don't. They don't need anything to get paid for this. We all get paid to, to work and film. You know, we have some of us have nine to fives. I work freelance. You know, you know, some of my other people work freelance. And so on our days off, we get together and we do stuff for Womp Stomp Films, or we go on a scout trip, or you know, we sit down and I'll I'll sketch out some panels and be like, you know, these are the shots that I want. What are we going to need to do this? And talk, you know, talk to my department people, but. It's really our, our hobby. It's, you know, we don't go off on Sunday and play golf. We figure out how to make movies. I'll tell you what. <clears throat> I love hobbies that are actually productive. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and it's not just productive for you. It's productive for everybody. You know what I mean? And What the hell kind of an analogy is that? And isn't it great, too, when a productive hobby uh, lets over a million viewers out there uh, see mm -hmm. your work? It's just it's incredible. Yeah, no, that is, it's definitely very humbling, and, and it's a great opportunity. And, and that's kind of one of the nicer things about Womp Stomp Films is we've got to the point where when we make something, now we're at the point where people are going to see it. So it's there's a cool incentive to it. We've, we've got inside tracks to certain... Um, you know, film festivals that really, you know, love our team and, you know, want us back for additional projects. We've been to the Telluride Horror Show three years in a row now, which is a big, you know, when, when we started, Never Hike Alone was the first short that I ever got, or I guess it was, it's a semi-feature. Like, it's the first thing I ever got into a film festival. And Telluride Horror Show was my first ever film festival with my own film, um, aside from doing like 48-hour film projects. But you know, since then, it's it's been a real like roller coaster ride. Never hike alone. Got in a lot of stuff. We just finished something called Pathosis, which is directed by a good friend of mine, Austin Boning. Uh, it just made its debut at the Telluride Horror Show, and we'll be uh, playing at Panic Fest in Kansas City, uh, July 25th through the 27th. And then we were, you know, we're submitted to a bunch of other festivals. We feel pretty confident about getting into 
at least half of them. <laughs> so, um, you know, and so that's going to be a good year for us. We released something called Imagine earlier this year, which was a co-production I did with uh, the guys from Brown Space Films, the team up there in, in Idaho. And, you know, that was something that we ran in the festival circuit, won a couple of awards, and then we released it earlier this year um, on our YouTube channel. And that's doing pretty well, and people seem to dig it. It's a three-minute short. We built it for, like, you know, one of those good three-minute, you know, short block films. Um, and yeah, we're continuing to, to just kind of redefine the mold and, and now we're working on never hiking the snow. So this just, you know, we're always keeping busy and, and people are really interested in what we're doing. And, you know, I think that like we've gone out and we've helped projects like the spirit of Haddonfield, um, the face of Michael Myers. Uh, we're currently working on Jason rising, uh, which is shooting up in Portland. And then we have Dylan's new nightmare, which is shooting in Phoenix, um, so these are all projects that we've, we've associated ourselves with and really just brought together a really cool community. These are all horror fans who are all on the periphery. They're either hosting YouTube channels or they're making films and they were acting and they're part of the world and they were like, hey, Vin, we saw what you did in Never Like Alone. How can we kind of recreate your success? And it comes down to, you know, I kind of teach them my philosophy. I teach them what I've learned from working in the professional industry about, you know, certain diligence that goes into each step of the process, a certain, you know, respect and, you know, reverence for the process and trusting it and not rushing and, um, you know, coming up with interesting story, making them, you know, really challenging them. I really try to challenge the teams that I work with. So at the end of the day, they know that they've given it their all. Um, and I'm really proud of everyone that I've worked with so far, and I'm proud of my team, you know, for the stuff that they've done on my projects. It's just, you know, we've built this little family, and we have so much fun. We spend so much time laughing on set. It's, it's you know, ridiculous how much, like, how much we mess around and still get stuff done, um, and it's not always easy. We're not always laughing. Sometimes it's of miserable. Course, yeah. We've been out there in the snow before. Um, we're getting ready to go out in the snow again, which is going to be absolutely miserable. But we're going to, you know, we've shot in the snow before um, in multiple occasions. Um, so it's nothing that we're not used to. It's just we know it's uncomfortable, but we're going to make the best of it. And our team spirit is really what's going to, you know, carry us through, you know, the couple of nights that we'll be out there in, at night when it's probably 20 degrees out. Um, but we're going to make it work and we're going to make some cool stuff. And I think people are really going to dig it. Oh, it's going to be great stuff. I did an interview with CJ Graham a while ago, and he was telling me a story about the end uh, <clears throat> when he's in the pool at the lake at the end, and mm -hmm. it was like a sub-freezing night. Everyone was freezing cold. He's down there for like six hours in this cold pool, so it's like it's amazing. So people don't always realize how much you have to sacrifice for your art sometimes, but uh, – uh, speaking yeah, of CJ mm -hmm. did all of his own stunts in that film. He uh, he's not he wasn't even a trained stuntman mm -hmm. at the time. It was very impressive. You know, it, it's funny, like sometimes – you hear there's there's stories about people who've been really well trained and then there are kind of the people who just fall into it and cj was one of those guys who kind of fell into it but because he had the right mentality and the right you know work ethic on uh, that the man is an incredibly hard worker i mean you probably talked to him about his post career yep as a manager of casinos and things like that and, and for someone to go into a, a an industry like that and really become a, a you know a veritable force for for what he did and be successful at it it just shows that the guy you put him in any situation he's going to succeed yeah i loved it because he was able to write his own ticket he actually turned down roles because i'm making too much money running casinos why am i yeah, gonna, no, why am i going to risk that you know but yeah real cool guy oh speaking of uh cold and in the snow would that be a never hike in the snow shirt you're wearing right now yes it is oh, oh let me move the microphone there's a free Ding. uh free quick plug there but um we'll talk yeah about right that there we later. just um yeah totally um just, I just, you know, you know, it brings up a great point too. Not to get off subject too much, I think this is the future of film. I really do, in all my heart, especially for the niche markets like some of the horror films. Yeah. Because you don't have studio interference. You're taking a group of people who who have a shared interest and they want to see respect given mm -hmm. to the movie and the character for the most part. I'd say <laughs> there there is a it's a catch twenty two. I think that like fan films have a ceiling. Uh, we definitely messed with the ceiling. You know, we pushed it a little higher. We showed that you can do some things. And I think that, you know, fans really can't do it. But there is a – there is definitely sacrifices that are made. Um, they're, they're, the money is insane. You know, to make feature films or to make film at all is really expensive. And I can tell you that basically every single, fee every single fan film you've seen, the fan filmmakers have dipped into their own pockets at some point to pay for it because they're so passionate about it. And as great as that is – 
it is kind of it's stressful and it puts a lot of people in in, in tough uh, situations. Um, luckily, we haven't gotten to a situation yet, but it could happen where you know one of these films doesn't get made. The money goes through, but nothing gets done, and then how are the fans going to react then? I think if anything. The studios need to look at what we're doing and replicate it on a process that's a little bit more guaranteed so that projects uh, come out the other end. Um, I would love to see, you know, the, the, the Friday the 13th franchise, you know, not only go back to the theater, but also look at streaming and say, look at all the great things that are happening. I mean, Child's Play has a series. You look at what happened with Love, Death, and Robots. Um, you look at kind of the things you can do for like Tales from the Crypt and, you know, Creep Show just came back. And the way that you can boil down these ideas, these fan film like ideas that you would never send to the big screen, but in a half hour episode or in an hour episode where it's just going to be streaming and you can do it for a price and you can do it for lower budget, it's not millions of dollars, but guess what? It's not $50,000 either. You're somewhere in that two hundred and fifty mm-hmm. dollars to $500,000 range to do something really special with additional industry professionals. You know, a lot of these fan film teams, they're, you know, they're good local filmmakers. They're they're indie filmmakers. They're doing it. And I think some of them should get the chance. But we don't always have access to the right equipment. We don't always have real, true, tried and true full crews. I mean, we have pretty basic, you know, full crews. But to have, like, the actual support from production and just the, the proper, you know, AD team and proper location support and all these different things. It's very expensive. And if those services were covered, and the things that really make the filmmaking very stressful, because most of the time we're directing and producing and we're doing all the things we have to cover everything. If these ideas were given a little bit more support from the studios and they were bringing in independent filmmakers to make these things for for online, I think that they would have such little risk. The fans would support it now even more because Friday the 13th would be putting its stamp on it. It would be official. You know, I don't know if you would call it canon, but I each I think what you would do is you would play with the canon. You'd come into a situation where you'd take, hey, you know what, I really love part eight for some reason. And I want to continue a story in that world. So you'd tell a story in that world and you wouldn't have to adhere to any other Friday the 13th. Or you're going to do something original, something based on a comic book, something based on a previous movie, something based on an original idea like Never Hike Alone, which is then also tied back to one of the films. So there's there's so many different ways to do it and there's so many ideas that surround Jason. It's not, it, you know, I think if we keep going after the formula, we're just going to see the same repetitive stuff. But if you take Jason, you take the story, you take the character, you take specific plot lines, and you give them a little bit of life and you put them through a different lens and you give them to a filmmaker with an interesting vision, Friday the 13th will breathe a whole new life. And I think that that applies to most of the, the slashers. I think that like a Freddy Krueger, you know, Wes Craven's estate is hearing pitches right now. It'd be amazing if we could get something on that realm with somebody coming up with a streaming series for that. Um, you know, there's the leather face of it all. There's Myers, there's Pinhead, the, you know, there's all these, and you know, Chucky's already got his. So why not? I mean, I don't see why, the, what better time to experiment than now when all these streaming platforms are, are picking up? And we know that the horror community is going to support it. They support Shudder. And you know that everyone who's on Shudder, if you told them that, like, oh, hey, you know, Friday the 13th is going to be on our streaming service, all those people would automatically sign up just for that, not to mention if it's probably something like Warner Brothers or something like that. Warner Brothers has its own library of DC and, and all the movies it's ever made. So I don't think they, they get that. I don't know. I just think it's a no-brainer for that to be where the series could go. So we'll get into a little more of the uh, Friday stuff here in a few minutes, but uh, let me just uh, get to know you just a little bit better. So tell us about the maybe pre-2008 uh, Vincent. I mean, uh, what, wow. what, what, where did you grow up in and what led you out to uh, out, out to Hollywood? Wow, yeah, no, so I grew up in a little town called Westport, Massachusetts, um, all my life. Uh, you know, I grew up, I, it was me and my mom, and then um, we grew up, you know, big family, big Italian family. Um, I was like a troublemaker in school. I was, I was watching too many movies, learning too many swear words. <laughs> and like, just, I was, I was a terror. Um, you know, in high school, I was an athlete. Um, I played three different sports. I got recruited to play baseball in in college, and I really thought that that was my trajectory. I loved sports. I loved being an athlete. I loved films too. So I was kind of the film nerd on all. Like I wasn't the typical jock. I was always like quoting movies and like acting stuff out, and always getting called out for like making a scene. And 
And, you know, I, and I always thought that like, that was always just part of my personality and I was just going to play sports. And in college, I kind of had a rude awakening with some injuries and some, you know, the kind of the status of the way my arm was deteriorating and I wasn't going to be able to do the things that I wanted to do. And I started to think back of like, if I could do anything else, what would I do? And I realized that I've been doing it the whole time. You know, when I was a kid, anytime they said, we're going to do a, a special project or a school project, I said, oh, can we make it a video project? I want to film it. And, you know, so I filmed video projects and made videos and made stupid skate videos and jackass videos and like, you know, everything and, and everything in between. And they were always, they always had a narrative and they were always like way too overdone yep. for what it should have been. <laughs> and so, and so that was when I was in college and it was around my junior year that I said, you know what, I'm really going to focus on this, this film thing. I started really focusing on editing. That's where I focused my, my degree. I got a, you know, a degree in film production, but most of my classes were in editing. Um, I was basically TAing the editing courses by the time I was done. I was teaching other people how to use all the equipment and basically cutting everybody's projects. Um, and I fell in love with it. And so like around 2007 is when I graduated college, uh, Worcester State University in, in Worcester, Massachusetts. I'd gone to three different schools. I went to uh, Hofstra and then I went to URI, but I was studying uh, journalism then. And I was kind of bouncing around trying to find the place where I fit in the best. And then I, when I transferred to Worcester, they actually had a true, a tried and true film program. Um, and so I went into that. Um, so that summer I was working at a liquor store. I had no leads. I had no job opportunities. Nobody wanted to hire me, uh, in Massachusetts. There was, you know, there was nothing. There was maybe one commercial house that like ended up shutting down three years later for fraud. Um, so, I had no in and I had a buddy who lived in LA who worked at a big uh, visual effects studio mm -hmm. who I said, Hey man, anytime you hear about a job open up, you just let me know and, and I'll think about it. You know, I'll go out there and interview and if they hire me, I'll, I'll move to LA. Well, whatever, I'll just do it. Um, and so months later he hit me up and cause this is one of my best friends. I've known this guy since I was five years old. He hit me up and said, Hey man, they're, they're interviewing. You should get out here and, and interview. It's a trap. So I flew out. Um, hung out with him all weekend. It was my birthday weekend in October. Um, I knew I was moving to LA no matter what. So I was, I was working at this liquor store and I was saving money. And I'm telling you, like, not the easiest job in the world. Um, I can, there were days where, like, I had to empty, like, the, the recycling machines, mm -hmm. which is cans and bottles. And, like, it just smells. And I, was just, I just kept thinking, like, oh, my God, like, get that job and, like, <laughs> never do this ever again. <laughs> which, what I didn't realize is that being a PA is basically that full time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but we'll get to that later. Um, so, yeah, so I went out and interviewed for this job and nailed it. They loved me. I had the recommendation. I had the right scores and I studied the right, you know, courses at school. They didn't need anybody who, who needed to, you know, operate brain surgery. It was just get people coffee and be a go-getter. Um, I worked for them for about four and a, so then I moved to LA uh, in uh, 2008, January 1st. That's when the job was starting. Um, I got there on day one, found out that the team that hired me was put on another job and they didn't have a PA position. And the new team, if they were hiring a PA, had to re-interview me. So I didn't have a guarantee at the job. So I just moved out there. I saved up all this money. I had no job. I thought I had a job lined up. So I, had, I started doing more interviews. Um, and then I interviewed for them again. And about a, you know three days later, they got back to me and said, all right, yeah, you got the job. It's, it's good. They, they hired you. We were going to hire you probably anyway, but we just wanted to vet you ourselves. So I worked on that, and that was The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, uh, the film where Brad Pitt is a 90-year-old man and then shrinks into a baby. Um, so we were, I was working on the team. I was PAing for the team that was doing all of the, the facial work, so making him look 90 and then mm -hmm. 80 and then 60 and then I think at 70, and then I think at 60 they went to facial prosthetics, and that was actually him. But other than that, it was a body double with a green hood on that they had to replace his head in every single scene. Um, and it was one of the first ever life-like um, life -like CGI that, that kind of like overcame the uncanny valley. It was done really, really well. I mean, say what you want, to, what you want about the film, but the visual effects were amazing. So I got to see that happen up front. I got to sit right behind Brad Pitt the first day he saw himself as a 90-year-old man and react to it <laughs> and get all giddy and be like, oh, man, is that really what I'm going to look like? And like, what? It's, it, there were really cool experiences. And so after that, I, uh, 
so after that job was over, that was it. They, you know, basically when you work on jobs like that, they just disband the entire team. You either move to another project or there's nothing for you, and they didn't have anything for the PAs. I mean, the artists go to stuff, they get sent to stuff, but the, all the other teams have PAs, and there's no other jobs. There's nowhere for me to go. So my bosses liked, you know, the job that I was doing, so they recommended me to a small commercial house that was hiring uh, that was called Radium. And that team, that that company did, like, car commercials and breakfast cereal commercials mm -hmm. and Target commercials and a lot of stuff. They had a lot of big accounts. Um, eventually, they were bought out by a company called Real Effects, which is based out of Dallas, Texas. And so we had satellite offices. We had one in Dallas. We had one in Santa Monica. And then we had our, our main office for Radium in San Francisco. Uh, and so those three offices were operated. I worked out of mostly L.A. Sometimes I went to San Francisco to cover for another PA. Um, and I was just doing vault work. You know, I, was, I ran the vault, I shipped tapes, I uh, did any down and dirt, dirty job that I could do. And about a year after that, I started going to my bosses and being like, I want to do something else. I want to do something else. I want to coordinate. I want to do something. Even though, like, what I really wanted to do was direct. Mm -hmm. But there was no path. I, no one ever told me how you, how do you become a director? Like, there was nothing to that. I just thought you work yourself up high enough and then people recognize you and then they let you direct. So I just thought, I'm just going to work my way up. And so, unfortunately, at the time, what actually ended up working out was they didn't have anything. So they kept me as a PA. There was nothing I could do. I didn't, I didn't have the equipment to shoot. I really didn't know anybody that could, like, pull it off. I didn't have those connections because I was working in commercials. Nobody was making narrative stuff. So one day, um, I talked to one of, the, one of the people who ran the company, and they told me, you know, they kind of, like, I'm pretty good at, like, finding out information. And I, I saw some stuff going down, some people coming in and out for meetings, and I asked what was going on and pulled it out of them that we were actually going to be doing a feature animated film. We were going to do the, 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 the first animated feature for this company, and they were starting to do preliminary meetings, and that they needed somebody to do notes. And I was like, let me do it. Please let me do it. And so they checked in with the, the, the producers. Sorry for the sirens. I live next to a fire station. <laughs> I thought you were on set, <laughs> but continue. All, no, I mean, it's, it's like every, every three hours it's this. Um, so... We, uh, so they checked with everybody and everyone was too busy. So I was the only one available to do the notes. And I sat in the meeting and I sat with the director, the writers. Um, there was a, you know, one of the stars of the film was there and coming do coming doing punch up work on the script and notes and pitching it. And, um, and that was really my first, I would say real film job. I was, I had a really important task of taking notes for these meetings and making sure that they were clear, that they were correct, that they followed what was being asked of. And I ended up being the first official hire on that movie. And I stayed with it for three and a half years through two different directors and four different producers and five different writers and all of it. And I kind of became like the walking encyclopedia of the movie. Example. And so anytime anybody had a question about where was this board or where, what happened in this scene or mm -hmm. what, how do we do this previously, I could literally just be like, okay, so in the previous version, um, the character did this, he came in here and did that. The problem with that was because in this scene, we established this and he wouldn't do that. So we needed to come up with something else. And that's why we did this, but this isn't working either. So we need to find something that's on the spectrum of this and this. And then they go, okay. And then they'd focus down on the problem and do that. And so I was always able to kind of track story for them. Uh, eventually I got hired as a story editor in my next job, working on a film called Rock Dog with the same, one of the same directors from Free Birds, this guy, Ash Brandon, who directed Toy Story 2. Um, he went on and he, he ended up leaving the Freebirds project and um, did the, it started Rock Dog and brought me on to basically be his right hand man. I mean, I was production managing, I was voice acting, I was doing a little bit of everything, recruiting, getting artists, um, just basically trying to put a team together so we could get this small little animated film boarded and cut and sold. And so I worked on that and then worked my way up into. Um, uh, then I worked to another company called Original Force as a production manager, and I did that for a while. Um, and that's when I started kind of really, I started realizing that I was starting to hit a ceiling. Mm -hmm. I was climbing upwards, but I wasn't getting anywhere near my goal. I was still in animation. I wanted to work in live action. I wanted to work in horror films. I was making kids' films. I wanted to direct. I was on the fast track to become a line producer, which if you ever become a line producer, that is the death nail on your creative career. Mm -hmm. Um and so I actually literally got to the point where they offered me a line producing position and I said, you know what? No. And I quit. Do it. Do it. 
And it was like, it's it was literally, I'd come, it's really hard to do. I mean, I, I realized, I, I mean, at the time it wasn't a hard decision. I realized that Never Hike Alone was, kind, I was about halfway through Never Hike Alone and I realized that I had worked really, really hard. I saved up some money and I had something. And something was pushing forward, and if I followed through with it, something good was going to happen. I just had that belief. And I didn't know how good it was going to be. I didn't anticipate, you know, still talking about it two years later. <laughs> but it, um, I just knew that it was going to be fulfilling. And I felt right doing it. It felt right directing. And it felt right leading a team. And so it was, you know, a combination of doing my, my everyday job and then volunteering for independent films that my friends were making and rec watching people, recruiting people, building a small team, starting to kind of do that. And then eventually it all kind of built up. And then, yeah, right at the, at the break between 2016 and 2017, I, um, I quit my job and I've been doing this ever since. Oh man, I, I love I love to see uh, self determination in people. You know, uh, actually kills a couple of my questions. I didn't even need to bother asking because you went into them for me there. But uh, you know, uh, I tend to do that. I tend to ramble. Well, I mean, hey, that's, hey it <laughs> saves me from having to uh, speak, right? No one wants to hear my voice anyway. So, but yeah, it's what I'm saying. It's hard. It's like you you can take a job. Okay, he's gonna you're gonna be a production line assistant or manager, whatever. You're gonna run the show mm -hmm. basically <laughs> behind the scenes, but you're that's all you're ever going to do, right? And you'll be kind of unseen. Yeah. You won't have too much creative control. You're just basically the enforcer, right, at that point. And, yeah, well, but it's I mean, secure. you're a It's a secure job. So it's, it's a secure job. You're a facilitator. Mm -hmm. You do do really great things. I mean, there, don't get me wrong. I, I had to learn my way. And I was very humbled by the process about how and crazy it was, not only from the fact that like just story creation is hard, but politics is hard too. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, having to like basically remind people that you're the right people for the, you're the right person for the job the entire time, no matter where you're at. But I always got a great reward out of working on a team and like, even if it was just a set of notes, placing a set of notes down on an artist's desk and having them read them and go, thank you. Like, I got so many notes, I didn't know what to do, but this puts it all in an organized fashion mm -hmm. for me that I know how to do this. I can just check these things off one by one and it'll be real easy. Um, you know, there were times that like I worked for a head of story and he was having a real rough week. So I cleaned his entire office just myself. And, you know, when he came in, everything was organized. There was no trash. There was nothing like, you know, how oh, yeah. sorry they get messy. <laughs> and so I would organize people and I would do things for people. I'd go the extra mile. So people felt like someone cared. Feels like an Arby's night. Um, and when you're a facilitator and you can help people who are creative clear that baggage of what's keeping them from getting to what makes them who they are, uh, it's really cool. That's why I still produce. I still like facilitating. I still like helping other people get things done. And I also like helping myself get done. You know, it's like when I have a problem on set, I can usually solve it. Mm -hmm. I don't need someone else to solve it, but I surround myself with smart people. So it's just adding on to that brain power. And so I'm able to kind of lead the conversation, but the, the experts in the specific divisions are able to guide us in those certain departments. And so because I have that ability to see the full picture of what brings a film together, I know how to make all those departments work together. And that's really a big key in becoming a, a director is not knowing just specifically what you want, but understanding what it takes for all these different departments to get you what you want. And if you know how to do that, you know how to basically, you know what to ask for. You know you're not going to ask for, all right, I want 20, you know, 100 foot robots to step into the scene and just smash this house and you're like well what's your budget oh, i got like 10 grand yeah. you know someone's gonna go well you know <laughs> you maybe you get okay. one yeah 10 foot robots and now, we're gonna and, uh, you yeah get we're gonna have to ask yeah and we're gonna have to ask an intern in like yugoslavia who wants to volunteer to build the robot and animate <laughs> it but we'll get you that you know so i, I kind of look at i i look at the things that i have that were through in my reach that were within my budget and then i'm creative with those things i don't try to reach out beyond what my subject matter is. I don't try to reach out beyond what my budget or what I have. It's what do I have? What can I create with it? And how can I do that on my budget? And then also make it interesting. So it's a lot of different things coming together. But the, the producing side and the story side, the two things that I kind of grew up in are what helped me get through and come up with those answers to make things, you know, affordable but interesting. Gotcha. So is there like one facet of filmmaking that you find – the most fulfilling, the part you like the best, like is it directing, writing, producing, acting, editing? What, what directing. Is, is it nothing? Directing. Hands down directing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's nothing. I mean, that's when 
I mean, you, there you are, you're the conductor. You're out there in front of the symphony, in front of the orchestra, and you're going to guide them. And everybody has a different job, and you have a vision. And when you play, when you hit the right notes, it you make magic, and you, you draw people into different worlds, and you send them on journeys. And, you know, I, I love that aspect. I love making film and then turning pe turning around and seeing people react to it in a theater and react to it online and react to it just any time. And so, you know, that that's the most fulfilling. I like acting. It's fun. Uh, producing is a big pain in the butt, but it's rewarding. Um, but there's nothing like directing. There's, a, it, there's no other feeling for me. Well, speaking of feedback, you seem to have gotten a lot of feedback on your probably most famous work, Never Hike Alone. So let's let's get into that just a little bit if we could. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and by the way, if I get to asking questions, you're not allowed to answer because of legal <laughs> reasons. I know that's it's it's crazy right now. With no, that. don't worry about just it. Say, no, 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 don't worry about and, that stuff. Okay, uh, but don't be anything like that. Too bad. So okay. How, how did this film get started? Was it just something that was tinkering on your head, or was it like a, a group idea? Yeah. How did this come about? <laughs> it started because I was doing, um, I was helping out on independent shorts, and I, you know, I had filmed a version of a hike alone at one point where I was like, oh, I just want to put a cool, like, Friday the 13th thing together. I built this really crappy cosplay, went and shot something, it was awful, and I buried it. And I just said, no one will ever see this. Um, but I like the idea. I like this idea of, like, Ooh, this guy trying to get away from Jason. Can he get away from Jason? What would happen? Um, and so I used to work on these independent film sets, and I would talk to people and be like, "Hey, you like Friday the 13th? Oh yeah, well, I used to watch the movies. Oh yeah, well, what do you think of this costume?" And I'd show them a costume, and they'd be like, "Well, that's pretty cool." I was like, "What do you think about if we made a short with this costume and released it on like a Friday the 13th as like a celebratory thing? Like, I'm thinking that could be a cool way to like." I don't know, get some eyes on our stuff, make a cool Friday the 13th short. I'm a big Friday the 13th fan. Like, I don't know, I think it'd be a fun, fun thing to do. I've never done a fan film before. And I recruited enough people at the early on stages that we were able to start developing it. It became this weekend project. I mean, this was the birth of Womp Stomp Films. It was really like, hey, let's all get in my car this weekend, drive out to the forest. I'm going to bring my costume. We're going to shoot random stuff. We're going to see what it looks like. We're going to come back. We're going to look at the footage. We're going to talk about what we shot, why we shot it. Does any of it work? And that's how we ended up creating the first trailer that was released in, I believe, May of 2016. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember because it was my, both my brothers were graduating from college. They both graduated from college the same, the same year. Um, and we had released it on, on that 13th. I was actually in New Orleans for my brother's uh, thing. We, we had released it. And that's when it kind of started to tick up and we saw that people were interested. That's also the same time that we discovered the abandoned camp that we eventually shot at. So um, it was really when we found the abandoned camp that things started to expand for us. We finally had this location that we were able to go to all the time for no money um, that had interiors, exteriors, interesting things to look at, interesting sets, interesting layouts, and just an overall just creepy atmosphere. And so we were able to capture how that camp made us feel in real life and then permeate that onto the screen. Um, and so that was really kind of like how Never Hike Alone came to be. It was, it was a matter of kind of just convincing some people to just experiment with me. And, and the more we experimented, the better things got and the, the, the higher the production value got. And then we started kickstarting, you know, so we kickstarted, tried to raise money. We failed the first time, raised some private money. And then, you know, kicked butt the second time, raised about 20 grand and were able to finish the film. But it took, you know, almost a year and a half to, to shoot everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, we started shooting in October of, of 2016 and we finished shooting in July of 2017, even with pickups on August 3rd. Um, and that was it. But we were jamming the whole time and everybody who worked in the film had full time jobs except for me. Like I had quit that year to work on it in 2017, but everybody else was working. So I had to kind of get everything prepared when everyone was working. And then when they were available, get them everything they needed to get stuff done. It was really, really hard. Um, but we got it done. And, and, you know, it was just this you know, fate kind of guided us. I just, I just trusted my instinct. I trusted my, my fandom of the, of the films. I, you know, I had a really odd premise, something you wouldn't really pitch for Friday the 13th and, and get, you know, taken seriously, the one man adventure. Um, but 
I, I'm my own, I'm my own worst critic. And so I think when I came up with the idea, I was also, you know, my own Friday the 13th fan saying, Oh, found footage. You're an idiot. Oh, one guy, what dumb, you know what I mean? I was like, no, like it basically like tearing myself down before I could even make it be like, well, mm -hmm. how can I overcome those things? How can I take a, a subject that I even think is a bad idea and make it into a good idea? And I think that challenge is what challenged me to be like, well, if you're going to do it, you're going to have to do it like this, and you're going to have to do it like that. And, and I, I had a very high standard for the cheese factor and the, just the overall like, production value factor. And I was like, if we can just keep everything above this line, we might surprise some people. And we might get people to kind of rethink Friday the 13th because I think I'm starting to rethink Friday the 13th. And it became this like... The way I saw Friday at the beginning of it and the way I saw Friday at the end of it were two different things. And, you know, I, I feel like right now I'm, I'm sitting on probably one of the coolest Friday the 13th stories that could ever be told with the whole saga thing. And, you know, I'm just, um, it's, I'm just really giddy and, and I'm ready to tell it. Now, there'll be some minor spoilers here. I'm not going to be talking about plot points or anything, but there's some things here that might spoil things a little bit so you haven't seen the movie maybe skip the next five or ten minutes but uh so uh this or is, just pause right here yeah just watch the movie yeah, and exactly. then come right back yeah, don't forget to like and subscribe over there too um exactly yeah watch something else. uh actually this one's not uh, any kind of spoiler but uh drew lady was actually kind of the solo in this film for basically carried most of the show by himself um mm -hmm. that's gotta be really difficult for an actor because he doesn't have anyone to play off of no cues no timing it's, it's really difficult do you have to direct him much or did you just let him loose and he did it on his own uh, andrew doesn't really need anybody to be entertaining andrew is entertaining that's one of the reasons why i thought he was perfect for the role oh and hopefully if all goes accordingly we'll find ourselves on the south side of the lake so today's mission will be find the lake i mean i hired andrew because he was my friend um, we became friendly during the rock dog days and I had always talked to him about this project. He was actually the hiker in the first version of it. And I asked him to come back and reprise the role. And from the two shorts, he like grew from like a young boy into a man. He looked like, <laughs> looked like Jax from sons of anarchy. And I was like, man, you got a really good look going right now. We got to keep this. It's very becoming. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so when we started doing it, you know, he was just so natural. And so I think because I knew him, I knew his cadences. I just, I knew how he spoke. I knew how to write for him. Um, I also had a lot of help from Nate McLeod with the script. You know, he was, he kind of wrote a version of it and then I rewrote it and kind of wrote it as I went along. But I always checked with Nate to get like really good character bits, um, and really help me keep it honest. But then Andrew on the day, it was kind of like, listen, man, like, here are the words. Let's read them out. But let me know when I put some marbles in your mouth. When I start to, like, put too many words, I try to be too nerdy. Because mm -hmm. you're not a nerd. You're a YouTuber. Like, let's get that straight. You're like, you're, you're not the sharpest tool in the shed, but you're likable. And you're, you have a high level of perseverance. So we'll at least give you that. But I don't want to make you sound like, you know, like you're... A walking exposition know, dump or nothing like that. A walking yeah. exposition dump. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It had to be. It had to be natural. You guys are not going to believe this. This place is way more than a nature preserve. Look what I found. It's got to be around here somewhere. And so he would take basically my expositional list of facts that needed to be regurgitated within the scene just to give certain updates for where we are and what's going on and how he's feeling. And he just did a really good job of carrying it. And every time he puts the, the, the camera on him, he lights up the camera. He looks really good on camera. I'm sure, you know, a lot of the ladies and some of the fellas were really, you know, happy every time he, he showed his, his, you know, golden face on, on screen. And, you know, and aside from that, you know, you know, not just that part, but then like all the physical stuff that he did and the fighting that he trained for and a lot of the pain that he had to like wear on his face and the terror and everything. I mean, he played almost every range of emotion in this film and you never get tired of him. And he's just, you know, it was, I, I remember when I sat down and I watched an early version of it, I just remember thanking my lucky stars that I had him. And I was just so happy that like, 
he just made me laugh all the time. And even on set, even now, I mean, like he's not even really in <laughs> never hike in the snow. I mean, he, we might do like some like we might have some like fun stuff on the side for him. But, you know, overall, you know, Never Hike in the Snow is a prequel to his story. But he, we want him evolved in some way. I just want him there on set just to make everybody laugh. Uh, you know, I'm working with him on 13 Fanboy right now. We worked on Pathosis together. Um, we're just really good friends. You know, sometimes we do conventions together. Um, we've done a couple festivals together. And, I mean, he sends me, like, you know, I don't know if you ever follow us on our – we have a Never Hike Alone fan page mm-hmm. on, on Facebook or even any time anybody posts about Never Hike Alone. If, if Andrew makes a comment or if I make a comment and then one of us replies, it just turns into, like, a 500-comment <laughs> thread of us just making fun of each other. I mean, he sends me, Kinda like – flame war. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. And, like, like, just lately he's got this kick of, like, sending me Instagram stories of him, like, farting into his camera. I smell meat. <laughs> like, it's – we definitely have a um, – a, like brother vibe between us and you know it you know I, I could never say that like we went to war together because war is a completely different beast but it's kind of like that's that's what I feel. he feels like a war buddy to me because never hike alone was such a hard year of both of our lives for many different reasons and we came out of it you know on top and it was because we believed in each other and we gave each, you know, he took a lot of risk. He couldn't cut his hair. He couldn't shave his beard. Mm-hmm. You know, his, his managers and agents were yelling at him all the time because he couldn't get roles because he looked like a stoner and a surfer and he couldn't, you know, cut his hair and be the, you know, the jock or anything like that. And I kept telling him like, guys, like all this small potatoes bullshit, like here he is, he's going to be front and center, put this, put him out there in this and then get him more roles based on this. Like that, this is the best thing you can, that we can do for him. And he trusted me, and you know, he, you know, that's how he got the role in Thirteen Fanboy. And and I'm still trying to get him cast in things. And I talk to a lot of people about him, and I always make recommendations that if you want like a charismatic guy and you need somebody who can who can kind of carry those that type of weight, Andrew's your man. Well, he certainly uh, carried the role really well. Um, like I said, watch the movies kind of a tour de force it's it's not the silent protagonist there is some exposition there but it's just the range like you said the range of emotions that he has to go through from happy-go-lucky jovial guy to Mm -hmm. something finding himself in the world's worst position that you can imagine and having to fight for survival it's it's something to see uh and it comes off really natural too But like I said, mm-hmm. I, won't, I won't go into too much with everybody else. Now, here's well, here's a minor spoiler, so five minutes or so. Um, was casting Tom Matthews something you planned to do from the outset? Having him, or did no, that kind of just evolve as the shooting went on? And you, you did know. I always want to work with Tom? Yes, 100%. Did I have any sort of plan to work with Tom on Never Hike Alone at the beginning? No. Um, in fact, it was my original plan to make Never Hike Alone, show it to him, and then say, hey, now I have a story for you. And, um, and luckily what happened was I met a man by the name of Barry J. He became an early executive producer on Never Hike Alone. He was one of the first people to privately invest in us. Um, and one day Barry called me and said, Hey man, I got a dinner with Tom Matthews. And I went, what? He goes, yeah, somebody hooked it up for my birthday and I'm going to go out. We're going to have dinner. It's going to be great. So Barry went out to, uh, dinner with Tom and his wife, Carla, and, um, it was Barry and his partner, Barry. And they um, they just kind of shot the shit, talked about Friday, talked about life. And at the end, Barry was like, hey, guess what? I'm EPing a Friday the 13th fan film. You should check it out. And Tom kind of went, oh, God. <laughs> and then he showed him the trailer. And Tom went, oh, that ain't bad. Like, what's the, what's the plan? And he was like, Barry's like, I don't know. But if we can get you a role, will you take it? He's like, I'll consider it. So... A couple weeks later, I met with Tom uh, at a little restaurant, and we sat down. Barry joined us. There's the three of us, and I showed Tom basically the first, not the first half of the movie, but the new trailer that had all the stuff from the first half of shooting on it. Um, and he was like, whoa, you guys really kicked it up a notch. And he said, well, what do you got for me? And I went, yeah, about that. So I had a plan for you to show up in the sequel, but we could kind of fit you in right now because right now the plan was – it was going to go to the end of the movie, and then, yeah, okay, it's major spoiler alert, major spoiler alert. You're going to go to the end of the movie, Kyle's going to get his head crushed, that's the movie. He dies. And- And 
then one of our other producers was like, but I love Andrew. You can't kill Andrew. Come up with another way to like get him out. Abort! Abort! And so I went, okay, let me think. Let me go back. And I thought of um, kind of the old films where like somebody would have a dream. They'd get killed in the dream and then they'd wake up and they'd be in the care of police or ambulances or something. And you would never get an explanation about how it was done. <gasps> Calm down. Everything's going to be all right. You're okay. It was kind of a classic Friday the 13th staple. So I thought I could do that and I can get some of my friends involved and we can, you know, we can cast a few people, you know, I cast, you know, Katie and, and Robert were two friends of mine. I was like, Oh, you guys can play the EMTs. That'd be perfect. They were in the red room, which was a previous film that I did. And then I was going to have Jessica Bennett, the stunt coordinator play the ambulance driver. But when Tom came along, I started thinking about the available roles that I had. And I started thinking like, Man, Tommy Jarvis, the ambulance driver. Kind of cool. Like, it's a cool role for him. Like, he has to do a job. What job could he get? He could become an EMT. He could drive ambulances. He's never done anything in his life that would stop him from doing that. You know, he's had so many traumatic experiences. He'd probably be really good at it. He'd be numb to traumatic yeah. experiences. Oh, somebody got run over by a car. <laughs> so what? I watched my best friend get his heart punched out through his back. Mm -hmm. Like, it can't get any worse than that. You know what I mean? And, you know, three different instances where he also fought an imposter. Let's not forget that, like, Roy wasn't a paramedic, but he was, you know, he did drive the meat wagon or he worked for that kind of crew. So there's a cool little tie into Roy in a little bit of him maybe, like, I don't know. There's some kind of weird like psychological thing going in there. But I think ultimately what drove me to make Tommy a paramedic was that it was his way of dealing with the guilt of all the people that he's lost. Mm -hmm. You know, all those people that he couldn't save. Well, guess what? Now he's in a position to save people every night. And I'm sure it's something that weighs heavily on him. He's definitely like one of those guys. Like, what was the sh the movie with like Nick Cage and he was an ambulance driver and he's just going nuts? Oh, um, I'm sure at some point <laughs> I'm sure at some point Tommy's been there, but for the most part, he works in the small town. He tries to take care of everybody. He's the town's darling. I mean, he's a little kid. He grew up there. He's one of the originals. You know, he's an OG Crystal Lake resident, so he belongs. It doesn't matter what he's been accused of or what he's done. He fits in the town. I mean, some people look at him a little weird, but for the most part, like they sympathize with him. They feel bad for him. He's lost. He lost his family. No, oh, excuse me. He lost his family. He lost his friends. Um, and, you know, so people can sympathize with him. And I think that, you know, once I kind of came to that conclusion of like, this fits, this makes sense. Well, let's make him that. Then it became about, okay, now we have Tommy Jarvis. Wow. What do we do? Because in the original version of the script, everyone died. Mm -hmm. Jason showed up, pulled the ambulance driver out, killed the two EMTs, went to the back of the ambulance, climbed in the back of the ambulance, and when we did that drone shot, there's supposed to be buckets of blood flying out the back of the ambulance. So then, and then you're going to see Tommy laying on the ground and the other two AMTs laying on the ground and just see, like, you know, basically it was kind of a cool, like, yeah, we, like, we saved everything to the end. And then I had Tommy Jarvis. So I went, I can't kill Tommy. Fans will freaking <laughs> kill me. So it went back and forth. It was like they either just drive away or Jason kills everybody. What do we do? What do we do? And then it came to a point where one of the members of my team said, well, what happens to Tommy when he gets pulled out of the, the car? I was like, well, in my head, he's like, he's like fighting Jason, but we can't show it because we don't have the money and the time to shoot all that. And they were like, but he gets like, you know, thrown down. I don't know if he necessarily dies, but I can't show how he doesn't. He goes, well, if he doesn't die, then he's not dead. And I was like, yeah. Oh, you know what? If he's not dead, he could come back. You know, he could save him mm -hmm. and then he could drive away. And like, it was literally like in that moment, it was like pop, 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 pop. And I saw all those shots and like the film, all of a sudden the end of the film as it, as it is now played in my head. And I went, there it is. It was like a combination of the two scenes, but now we got a Jason action. We got some kills in there. And then we open up the Pandora's box to be like, now the world is ours. And now there's so much more story to tell. The story continues, but we're out of money. So and time. So <laughs> out of money and time. So here it is. This is the ending of this part of the story. And I pitched that to Tom and Tom loved it. And then my producers were like, all right, Vin, um, we're going to put Tom on the Kickstarter. And I went, no, don't do that. Um, that's going to, 
kick us in the ass because everyone's going to be expecting Never Hike Alone starring Tom Matthews coming back as Tommy Jarvis and they get him for five minutes and they'll shoot me in the back of the head. Um, let's keep it a secret because when those doors open, nobody will see it coming. This will be the most blindsided reveal and it will be Friday the 13th history when this happens. Like people are absolutely going to lose their friggin' minds. Excuse me, I got to go pee. Must be the excitement. No. We have to keep it a secret. So it came a locked down secret on our set that Tom was involved. Only few people knew. The crew found out when we were going out to shoot with him in July. There was a very small crew that shot that. We, you know, we had photos on set and all that stuff. I said, hey, you don't post anything. You don't say anything. And everybody was able to keep their mouth shut. I only told a few people outside our team to like be anticipating for it so they can catch it and promote mm -hmm. it. Um, and then it was that night, and I remember seeing everybody's face in Telluride, and I remember reading the comments, and I'd seen some of the reaction videos of people like having to like stop and be like, whoa, who is this? Is that? Wait, it, yeah, it sounds like him. Holy sh that's Tommy. And you're like, it's a cool thing. you know. So that was a cool thing that, that we did that other than some of the professional fan films that have been made by professional filmmakers who have like called on their famous friends to come in and like act in them. Mm -hmm. Nobody had ever really, I mean, and maybe the, I could be wrong. I'm sure there's other instances where people have reached out and got people to be in their films, but it felt like I had never seen it before, especially in the Friday the 13th fan film world. Um, and people hadn't seen Tommy in over 30 years. Tom had quit acting. He was just a like CJ. He stopped taking jobs because he was making more money as a as a as a contractor, you know, building houses. So he came out of retirement to be in Never Hike Alone and has since restarted his acting career. And, you know, to pat myself on the back, we were at a, a screening for Barry J. Barry, so Barry went on to direct a film called Killer Therapy and cast Tom in it to play uh, the lead character's dad. And during the QA, Tom kind of turned to me and said, you know. A couple years ago, Barry and Vin came to me and asked me to be a Never Hike Alone, and, you know, I've got the bug for acting again. And so it's kind of cool. Now Tom's, like, in a Western. He's in uh, Killer Therapy. He's going to be in future Never Hike Alone stuff. He's getting cast in other roles. So it's nice to see Tom Matthews returning to the scene because he's definitely a fan favorite, and the fans want to see him in more stuff. And I hope that, you know, he starts getting cast for bigger and bigger things. And then as I move up in the world, if I get an opportunity to direct a high level independent or a small budget, you know, studio film that guess what? I'm going to make room for Tom and I'm going to pay him back. and I'm going to get him back out there on the big screen where he belongs. Well, I'm sure he said the same, same thing about you as well. Cause like I said, you seem to have rekindled his passion for uh, the, the thespian arts. So, <laughs> um, speaking of a thespian, you yourself, uh, were in this movie as well as some others. Um, you actually uh, donned the hockey mask and picked up the machete and played Jason Voorhees. Now, was this completely your portrayal of him, or did you kind of base the character on one of the former actors of him, like Ted White or CJ or um, Derek? You know, I think it came mostly. I mean, at the at the end of the day, I think it's it's. There are things from all the performances that I, I look at and things that I like that certain people do. Obviously, Kane really honed a performance for for Jason. Um, CJ did things. Ted did things. Richard did things. Steve did things. Um, and those were the ones that I really focused on with those actors, even Derek to a, to a certain degree, because Derek, I think Derek and Steve and Richard really had the most humanistic mm -hmm. Jason that thought and felt and you know kind of had a personality and you know ted did too but ted by the time ted came around it was so brute force at that point jason was such a killing machine so it's kind of like ted really brought like a great killing machine atmosphere i think that steve and you know and 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 kane and and richard brought some you know some humanistic qualities to him that made him sing and, and our version of, of ghost jason was undead so i wanted to bring back some semblance of that part two, part three character that had a personality that had a life at one point. Now he's undead. And so he's got all those characteristics of CJ and Kane where, you know, he's unstoppable and he can, you know, go through anything and you can put anything in his way and it's not going to stop him. Um, and, and so it was kind of calming that. And then it, it, can't, it comes down to, okay, how do I look in the costume? How do I move in the costume? How does this costume move? How does it move? You know, because there's a lot that goes into it. And I mean, the only reason why I played Jason was because it was my costume. <laughs> I built it for me. It was, it was cut for me. Um, 
And I never really anticipated a 54 minute film. I thought we were making a five minute, 10 minute film, which, you know, easy. You know what I mean? I come out, I, I, sw I swing the machete a few times, bing, bang, bung, we're, we're done. And, um, and instead, you know, it ended up becoming this character study. It was the first time I really had to study for a character and become a character on, on screen. And so I spent a lot of time in the woods, in the costume, walking around, figuring out my stride, figuring out my body mechanics, my gait because I couldn't just imitate what the other guys were doing. My body doesn't work the way their bodies work and everybody's body works differently. So what I try to do is think about the way that Jason would move if he had my body or if I was undead, like how would I move or how would I kind of process? How, how does my brain process? How quick does it process information? And so that turned into how fast will I move? How fast will I react? And then I had to take all of that knowledge and then I had to hand that over to my stunt double, who was Brian Forrest, who did a, you know, a lot of heavy lifting in the costume as well. So I wasn't always in the costume. I had to direct. Um, and some scenes I could direct while I was in costume and other scenes I couldn't. And that's when Brian stepped in. He did a lot of the fighting. He did a lot of the fight choreography. He did a lot of the stunts, you know, for safety's sake. A lot of it was for safety's mm -hmm. sake. And then a lot of it was also for time's sake because when he was in costume, everything moved faster. I didn't need to review every take. I was watching every take. So we're able to just say, yep, that's it, move on. Yep, that's it, move on. Instead of being like, oh, you know what? Because I get really self-critical about how I move. And so I was able to really get Brian there quickly because I was looking at it from the outside. And then I became better over time at knowing what worked. And so there was a lot of trial and error going back and forth with, with Brian and myself. Um, and I would say that when I reprised the role for the character in Disappear when we shot the music video earlier this year, that was an amalgamation of everything I learned from Never Hike Alone. And I felt that every movement that I did in Disappear feels like how I wanted to play Jason the entire time. And I feel like I now have a honed craft of who Ghost Jason is, how he walks, how he thinks, everything, how he feels emotionally. Like, I'm so tapped into the character. It's a lot of fun. And Brian's going to come back. We also got Doug Tate, you know, signed up to come on board. And so there's, you know, the three of us are really going to handle different duties at different times because of the way we're shooting this film, not everyone can be available all the time. So sometimes I'm going to be Jason. Sometimes Brian's going to be Jason. Doug's going to show up and play Jason, you know, in certain scenes. So it's going to be really cool because we're going to get different looks in different scenes. Um, but ultimately there's one kind of path to follow and everyone's kind of following my lead on it. Um, and yeah, I mean, so as a Friday the 13th fan, crafting a Jason, crafting a new Jason in this ghost Jason character has been probably one of the most fun parts. It's like of all the wheels that need to turn, that's a really important wheel. And so we took a lot of time to, to really handcraft that thing. So it wasn't, it didn't come across as hokey. It didn't come across as low budget, that it feels like a living, breathing Jason. Well, like I said, it certainly portrays well. He's uh, still the silent protagonist you know and love. He still has a lot of the same mannerisms, but you might find something new in this flick you haven't noticed about him before. So, Because there is a lot of... Yeah. He has a lot of screen time uh, compared to a lot of the Friday films in this. A lot of times it would be like a five-second mm -hmm. and then jump cut to something else or him slashing. This time you see a lot mm -hmm. of his full movement, and it's, 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 really, it's really done well. And a quick sidebar. Yeah, well, hmm? oh, Go ahead. I just want to give a, a quick shout out there, speaking of that, to Jessica Bennett and Brian Forrest for a lot of the work that they did on when we did the fight sequences of not making that seem goofy. When you on so out loud, hey, Jason's gonna fight a camper. Sounds cool. Application, that can go wrong in a lot of different ways. A fight scene mm -hmm. with Jason, that could look stupid. KM and Jason X. Um <laughs> Or you know, and it, it, oh, or, no. <laughs> or it could look kind of. It, it, it might not look bad. Like, um, well, how well, how can I forget Julius in Part Eight? Mm -hmm. You know, when he's punching Jason, I don't mind what's going on. I actually think it's kind of funny. Um, and so I had to find something between KM and Julius because I couldn't have <laughs> Kyle's head knocked off in the no. first scene because it'd be a short movie. Um, and I couldn't have KM doing cartwheels and kicking him in the balls and like all this stuff. It's just it's just silly. But we had to make it feel grounded. And I think that's ultimately where Never Hike Alone lives the most. Is like I tried to take Friday the 13th and ground it as much as I could. So I could bring people to make it feel real again. But then we know 
as we go on and the film moves on, it becomes more and more of a Friday the 13th film. We kind of lift off the grounded and become a little ungrounded with the undead nature of things and the way Jason moves and the things that happen, you know, and the things that, that Kyle finds. That's when it becomes there. But because we set such a grounded base, people went along for the ride. They didn't do what later films did, which was just, hey, you're here for Friday the 13th, you dumb idiot. Sit down and eat this cheeseburger. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that we shit all over it. <laughs> you know, they just like... They just treated the fans like crap because, ah, whatever. We can just do whatever they want. Yeah, yeah, yeah now he's this. Now he's that. Yeah, you know, now, yeah, now there's a river that leads it out to the lake, and they're going to go to New York on a thing that doesn't even look like a cruise ship. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Stupid kids. Um, you know, it, 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 it was a franchise that was really treated poorly. No one really cared. I mean, not to say that they didn't care. They didn't want to get product done. But no one really was there going, like, how do we keep the artistic integrity of Friday the 13th moving forward? It was just, yeah. hey, we need 10 more kids yeah, to They had a formula. They had it down so well that they'll know people, they'll get asses in seats. All they got to do is, you know, offer 10 people to be butchered and have hot girls or whatever. And, hey, and you know, but... And hey, let's, let's, I mean, you know, you talked to Adam Marcus a couple of weeks ago. We can talk about part five too. But anytime they tried to do something out of the box, yeah. they got shot down. Yeah. Fans got crazy. So, of course, they're going to keep going back to the formula because the fans keep yelling mm -hmm. at them every time they do something different. Never Hike Alone was really the first thing that came along in the Friday the 13th world that was different that fans accepted. But it was because it went back to grounding and it went back to telling a really good story. And it took a lot of the. It took a lot of the things that I learned when I was learning story and feature animation because I mean I mean I don't know how how you feel about feature animated films but if you watch feature animated films most of the time they are some of the most well crafted stories in cinema there's some of the best stories that are told are animated films and because there's so min like the minutia of how to make one of these films it, it it requires the story to be that good I mean some of them not everyone's that great but for the most part the stories are ambitious and they're well told and they're well paced and they're well you know well done for the most part and that's how i was taught to make film at that point i was taught how to make story that way i didn't do the the typical live action thing where it was like oh just do this and that and then shoot it and go you know it was really about like all right this is really going to carve out this thing like piece by piece and it's it's got to follow the storyline so i didn't go forward until i had the story i wanted and i was rewriting as i went <laughs> along the way just to make more things fit mm -hmm. because i was coming up with more ideas but it was always this is adding more to the story. This is adding more to the atmosphere. This is adding more to the tone. This is giving us a little bit, like, we didn't have all the ribbons there at the beginning, so it became a challenge for me to, like, how can I weave all the ribbons in without being too gratuitous about it? How can I just pepper them in? Give like obviously we're given like the Kevin Bacon scene, like a lot of screen time, but you know, you know I can't remember Mark maybe you know getting strung up on the door. Yeah, we don't really have the materials for that, but we can go buy his ribbon. You know, so there were certain things that we could do, things that were really recognizable, things that weren't as recognizable, and we just knew how much screen time to pay attention to each thing. But we wanted it all to lead up to because it pays off. It pays off on that beach at the end of the movie when we see Pamela's tag. <laughs> And it becomes a symbolic moment, you know? It's like, that's where it all began. And that's really like, you know, there's so much, you know, there's so many metaphors in that scene that I think if you really pay attention, you realize that all these things are happening. Like one, he's gone to the, his, this place in this dream where everything began. That's where the curse began. This is kind of, that scene is, is, is the curse taking hold of Kyle? And you know, one of the big things about never that I want to say about Never Hike Alone is like, you may survive, but things might not get better. <laughs> you know, what happens afterwards might be worse. What he's about to experience is, as we know, with the Tommy Jarvis character. Life not might get easier for him. He's going to have PTSD. Jason's going to haunt him. The curse is going to call him back. And that dream is really the curse taking its hold and gripping him 
and getting inside of him. And that's really something we're going to explore in these sequels that we have coming up um, and the way it permeates out and kind of affects everybody in the town. Um, and that's a big part of it. For me, the curse was a place to kind of settle my knowledge and base everything out of, base it out of the first film, treat it like a real curse and say, that's what sprung everything into action. And so, um, and so that's really like, you know, that, that was a really big important part for me was like taking the Friday the 13th story and then showing people that no, if you really pay attention, there's a really good story here that's just dying to come out. But it, the formula has been stepping on it for years because who wants story when we can get boobs and blood? Mm -hmm. Hey, you want a beer? Or do you want to smoke some pot? Or we can have premarital sex. So now audiences are shifting. You know, the internet came out. People are seeing plenty of boobs on the internet. They're seeing plenty of blood on the internet. And what you're seeing is this, this, um, is this wave of people who want story and character. And that's why they're gravitating towards binge watching uh, TV episodes. Cause in film, there's only so much character that you can create. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the characters that we've grown to know and love have gone over three and four films because that's how you really learn about their characters. Unless it's a two and a half, three hour film in, f in TV, you go along for a season, you grow with these characters, you watch these long story arcs that you can give natural time to progress. And, that's what people are gravitating towards. They're gravitating to these, these characters that they want to see every week. And so if you take that application and you put it in Friday the 13th, you come up with a story like Never Hike Alone. It, it creates threads that can continue to live on and not feel like you're forcing the story forward, but that the, forward is push, the story is pushing its own self forward. It's driving itself. It's, it's like when you make a movie, you want people to feel like they're getting into a roller coaster and then about halfway through forget they're on the roller coaster and make it feel like it's just this is really happening to them. And so... By doing that, you come up with good characters, somebody that we can identify with, and then a good story that pulls them along that you want to see them in situations that make it interesting the entire way. So if you can keep that balance between your characters and your story, all you have to do after that is come up with some good action, come up with some good laughs every now and then, and mix it all together. And it's usually the good, at least the good basis and foundation for at least a well-told solid story. How well it will do, nobody really knows. But the bait, you know, the goal of a filmmaker is to make something that makes sense and tells a story and has a message. And I think if you can do those things, at the end of the day, you walk away with something that people are going to be drawn to. And speaking of uh, established characters uh, coming back to life again, you also, I happen to see you uh, play Michael Myers in The Spirit of Haddonfield. Um, uh are you the next Lon Chaney? What's what's going on here, man? Or, oh, are being uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I <laughs> yeah. I uh, I asked to be. I was asked to be Mike Myers by Renee Rivas for Spirit of Haddonfield, and then again by the guys at uh, Hawthorne House Films, um, who did uh, the face of Michael Myers. So I get to play him twice, and playing Mike's a lot of fun. And you know, I just got the size. I'm six three. Uh, I know that original Mike Myers is like five ten, but. Um, you know, I got, I got the good size and it was a good opportunity and I had so much fun playing Jason and then I was like, Ooh, I bet I could play Michael. And it was a completely different headspace. It was a completely different character. <laughs> and that's when I really kind of like, I'd always had respect for acting and I'd done a lot of voice acting and I'd always become another character, but when you're silent and you have to be someone else, um, it actually opened up this other door to acting to me that I, that I never really knew. I never really kind of appreciated. And really it was like who you become internally. So I think like I'd, be, I'd come up with a version of Ghost Jason. I played Michael Myers and had to come up with a complete internal mechanism to be him and his body language. And then I realized that I took so much effort to create that internal body language for Michael that I should go back and re-examine what I did with Ghost Jason. And I did that. I took a little bit more of a, of a, of a deeper look into it and expanded upon the character for future stuff that I've been doing. Um, so it's a really cool, um, really cool opportunity. And I'm also getting to play, um, uh, I'm getting to do stunts for uh, 13 fanboy where it's a completely new character. So we, you know, Deb and I, you know, and our team have, uh, you know, it, you know, I'm stunting for it. So I have to like kind of come up with a body language that matches somebody else's body language, which is a mystery. But, we talk about that we talk about, okay, like how am I portraying this and doing it? So now I feel like 
I don't know. I kind of want to do all the mask roles now. Just like sign me up. The only thing I probably can't do is Freddy. Like it's just too much. That one's so specific. I don't know if I could really get that one. Yeah, it's kind of hard to ham it up that hard sometimes, <laughs> but because you almost have to have that's what audience. Unless you bring it back to the original kind of guys when he wasn't the jokester when he was more serious, you know, and scary. Yeah, I mean it depends, but it just depends on what you want to do, what your style is. That's the whole thing about all these films is that there's a different style for each one. We all came into it at different times. Each one has a different appeal to us. So sometimes some of us love Funny Freddy, other people love Serious Freddy, and you know other people love New Nightmare Freddy, and so it's just like. You know, I, I everything is kind of its own thing. As long as it's done, as long as it's done well and consistent throughout a pro, throughout a film, it, you can get away with it. Hey, so I know it's your Friday night, so I only have a couple more questions for you. If you can just hang in there for a few more minutes, uh, and I'll let you get on your way. I do appreciate you spending. Yeah, this we'll much do like a, a speed round. Yeah. yeah. So, um, as far as shooting the film, was there anything that you wanted in the film really badly? It just it couldn't get in for whatever reason, budget, time constraints, couldn't get the actor, whatever it was. Was there any particular thing that you really wanted to include that didn't make it? There were two things. One of them was cut out purposefully. In fact, we did a, uh, this recent 420, we showed a cut scene from the film uh, that would have made it in where we show Kyle smoking weed. We had, you know, we, had, we played with a version of like, well, maybe we should try to work some marijuana into the film. Mm -hmm. And when he smokes weed, that's when he accidentally finds the, the hidden trail. Hey, the van's on fire! Kind of like the trail showed itself to him, like, oh, smoking weed, come here, stoner. We need to teach That's you a right. lesson. That's the trigger for Jason um, anyway, right? Weed the trigger, and sex. yeah, but it, <laughs> it, it, made it, so, it made it so hokey that we took it out. But we ended up releasing that scene, kind of a version of it. I kind of hacked together a scene um, that's on our, our Instagram somewhere. Uh, I should put it on our YouTube, too, because it was, it was really funny. But just look for Happy 420, April 20th this year, we, we posted something. So that's one. The, the only thing I couldn't do that I wanted to do was make more use of Kyle's knife. Um, he flashes that thing the whole movie, and he doesn't even get to use it. He tries to stab him once and gets tossed over a table, and the, and the knife disappears. Finish well, the reason why that is because it would have been too expensive to, to buy 15 different shirts and jackets that would have had all different knife wounds. And because we weren't filming in order, I would have had to remember, like, okay, I think he's got nine knife wounds right now, so we could use the nine knife wound jacket. and that It was just too mm -hmm. much, so we... We kind of had to, to kind of kiss that idea goodbye. But if I had all the money in the world, it would, it would, he, Kyle would have been using his knife a lot more, stabbing him in the neck, stabbing him in the chest, getting away, um, which would have been really cool because it would have showed more of that undead potential. But I think it led to eventually we stuck that axe in his neck and he pulls it right out. So I think at least I got that. like, And that kind of made up for it. Mm -hmm. But I wish I could have done more with the knife and made more use of it. So... All right, so this movie, I don't know if it's a, a third of it, but it's kind of a blend of a found footage film and a more standard typical film. W was mm -hmm. this difficult to, to put together, like in editing or when you're shooting at all? Cause it, no, not at all? Just nope, natural? not nice at all. It, we had re two really great templates to work from, which were 127 Hours in the Martian. Both those, both the, Danny Boyle <laughs> and Ridley Scott. So um, it's Ridley Scott did The Martian, right? Was that really? Well, I know he did Covenant. And all I think that. that was. Did he do Martian? I don't know. I'll um, look. It up. I'll look I'm pretty talking. sure he did the Martian. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But two great filmmakers. Uh, the cinematic language in both those films was very informative for how we would shoot Never Hike Alone. In fact, uh, the fastest man in space uh, speech that Matt Damon does was kind of the first scene that I broke down camera wise and said, all right, the way they shoot it in the Martian is they basically cover three angles and then they do the found footage. So every time we do a found footage scene, we're going to cover it in three different angles, a wide, a medium, and then kind of a cool obscure shot. And then we're going to take the GoPro and putting it in an interesting place. And one thing they did really well in 127 hours is the way that James Franco interacted with the camera, the way he moved it around, and he became his own cameraman. So there was a combination of The Martian setting up for more of the, here's my entry for the day, and I'm leaving, here's everything that I'm doing, blah, 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 and I'll see you guys tomorrow, that type of stuff. And then the stuff that was like picking up the camera and moving it around and having specific blocking for the camera because we wanted to show certain things at certain times. So I think the challenge, the biggest challenge was mostly for Andrew to hit his marks where we would be watching the monitor, which was just a little phone off to the side mm -hmm. of the trail, and say, eh, nope, you, 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 you're you, too high. you got to be more in front of your face, or you need to be more out here. You really need to show that, so swing your arm out. 
And so imagine having to remember all your lines and then also remember all your camera placements. So there's a little bit of a challenge in that, but for the most part, it's, it's, it's a method that's worked before and we just had to follow the staples and tell our own story with it. And so as long as we told our own original story with it, we could really take the mechanics of what it takes to shoot a, uh, you know, a, a mixed footage film and, uh, and make it look cinematic. Yeah, I always did kind of equate uh, Kyle to the protagonist 127 Hours, too. That was a great film as mm-hmm. well. I was like, he's a happy-go-lucky guy, too, and he has this, this spirit yep. about him. Even at the end, the spirit's kind of soaring as he gets out of there. But um, Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's what we say. We used to say like the only difference between 127 Hours and Never Hike Alone is one guy gets his arm stuck on a rock and the other guy runs into Jason Voorhees. <laughs> Other than that, like it, you know, I mean, it's really the same type of story in in a certain way. Um, oh, by the way, it's just its you, own. You were right; it was Ridley Scott. I didn't realize he'd done a film between Prometheus and and Covenant. So <laughs> nice. That, yeah, I knew. I knew. Yeah, I knew it was. It was I, I had a feeling. So um, okay, let's let's get out of Friday. So um, I know you talk about there's uh there's a prequel coming up that's Never Hike Al- or excuse me Never Hike in the Snow. Um, mm-hmm. What other projects do you have in the works right now? I see lots of horror stuff, um, tons of like mm-hmm. fan stuff. So w- what's next for uh, Vincent here? Yeah, so I'm actually attached to direct a film called The Kindness of Strangers. Um, I can't talk too much about it because we're in the script phase of it. Um, but it was a project that I was attached to. It's an official project. It's not going through any studios right now. It's it's something that's owned by the agencies. Um and we're going to go out and pitch it next year. And so I'm really excited about it. I've been working on it all year uh, behind the scenes of everything with a small little team. Um, and we basically just, you know, there was a script that was brought to me and I was asked to attach myself and give notes and guide it into a place where we thought it could be into a more shootable version. Uh, we've guided it pretty much to there. We got a couple notes on our last round and we got to go back and, and kind of, well, that's what we've been working on now is just going back and doing the final touches on it, handing it back in and then pitching at the, the beginning of the year. Um, and like I said, like it, it's, it's a really cool film. Um, I can give you the premise. It's about two uh, serial killers that discover each other on the open road and then battle it out to the only ones left standing. Whoa. Um, and it's just a cool horror comedy. And I think it really fits my aesthetic. Um, I get to do a lot of cool things in it. Um, you know, from a directorial standpoint, I got really good characters in here that have been written by a char- uh, writer by the name of Ian Bush. Um, he, you know, that's really what drew me to the script was these two characters that I just loved. Um, and it kind of really fell in love with and I wanted to tell their story. And so we've been working on that ever since. And, that, you know, I got to thank my manager, Gavin Dorman, for hooking that up. Uh, you know, Joan Mao over at Circle of Confusion for putting us all together. And, you know, so that's, um, that's all coming together. And hopefully sometime next year, you'll hear an announcement that, you know, Never Hike Alone filmmaker Vincent DeSanti is doing his first, uh, you know, independent feature film. Oh, man, like you're like Cameron now. You have a little, uh, little byline in front of your name every time now. <laughs> it's Never Hike Alone. Yeah, no, it really is. It's it really, it's so, I mean, you gotta, you gotta look at how ridiculous this is. Because prior to this, if I had ever told anybody, yeah, I'm gonna make a, a fan film. And that's what's going to do it, man. They'd be like, and I literally, people are like, why are you wasting your time? Why are you wasting your time? And I can't tell you what it was, but something told me that this is what I needed to do with my life. And it was the only thing that brought me happiness, that brought me like true, like happiness at my core of like, this is all I want to do. And I just followed that. And we're only on this earth for so long and we only get one shot at it, you know, as far as we know. So why not? You know, just I went for broke and it paid off. You know, I, I I don't know how to explain it any other way. So where can people go to uh, learn about your future projects and to see what you're up to in your everyday life, uh, social media wise? Best way to do that is wompstompfilms.com, uh, W-O-M-P-S-T-O-M-P-F-I-L-M-S.com. Uh, On that site, you're going to have links to all of our projects, everything that we're working on, original projects, fan films, um, the Never Hike Alone saga is on there, all the posters and things like that. You can read about the things. Um, Our social media uh, links are there as well. So we're on Facebook and we're on Instagram and we're on Twitter and we're on YouTube, of course. That's where all of our movies have been posted. Uh, Of course, Never Hike Alone is there. Some behind the the behind the scenes is posted there. our short film Imagine has been posted there. Um, there's some previs that we did for uh, Pathosis that's up there and some other 
you know, fun stuff here and there that we've put up, our trailers, things like that. Uh, we're hoping to expand Womp Stomp Films on YouTube uh, pretty soon, add more projects. Um, I got friends who make films who are looking for an outlet. So we're thinking, you know, why are we spreading it all over the Internet? Let's just put it on Womp Stomp Films and have it be a place where people can put their independent short films, put the Womp Stomp logo on it because we've helped out. And, you know, put it in front of 20,000 people. And we're hoping to grow our fan base even more. Um, that's kind of our goal for 2020 is to really up the fan base and make us kind of a, not a household name, because I don't think, I don't think we're quite ready for that. I mean, I don't want to be dumb about it, but I think that we can, I think we're starting to become a name that's recognized on the independent circuit and, you know, especially in the, in the horror world. And I think that we can continue to do that. And that's our goal. Uh, and for those that are interested, I do believe that uh, Never Hike Alone is available on Blu-ray. Is that correct? That is correct. In fact, we're running an Indiegogo right now. Uh, we finished it a couple months ago. We successful funding for Never Hike in the Snow, but we left it open in demand. So you can get a copy of the of Never Hike Alone on Blu-ray through the Indiegogo, which you can get to through our website. Um, you can also pre-order Never Hike in the Snow. Um, you can get the Blu-ray for that. That will come out, obviously, after the film is done, so don't ask me when you're getting it, because I don't know. <laughs> um, there's also simple things like you can give us $5 and get your name in the film as a credit. Um, we still have producer tiers that are up. So if you want to become a big time backer in this film, put your name at the front credits with, you know, the rest of us, um, you can do that as well. So it's just up to you. And, you know, we're always looking for, you know, the more support that we have, the easier it is for us to, to do this, the more, you know, support we're going to have out there on set. So not only are we going to technically do this right, but we're also going to be kept safe and warm. Uh, we're shooting in a very hostile environment when it comes to weather. And, you know, all of this money is going into, a lot of the money is going into keeping us safe mm -hmm. and alive. <laughs> yeah, it's not easy. I've, I've done some cold work in my time. <laughs> it's just, it's not yeah, fun yeah. and you got safety and people will probably be wet and people will be sweating and hypothermia is always a risk. So yeah, so be safe out there, guys. So, hey, I know it's Friday night, so I'll let you get back to it. Uh, like I said, anyone out there who has not seen this uh, film, Never Hike Alone, at the very least, go out, stop watching me right now, go watch it, yeah. set it aside an hour, sit down and really watch. And you don't even have to be a fan of Friday the 13th, honestly. It, it helps, but I mean, you'll get just as much enjoyment being a complete novice to the series as to being a longtime fan. So go check it out. So, hey, Vincent, I really want to uh, give you my great thanks for coming on the show tonight. Uh, is there anything else you want to put out there before uh, we uh, sign off? Yeah, I do want to mention one other crowdfunding campaign that's going on right now. Actually, two, uh, Jason Rising, a Friday the 13th fan film, is still uh, in demand on Indiegogo. They've been raising some post-production funds. And then uh, Dylan's New Nightmare, which is a Nightmare on Elm Street fan film, a sequel to uh, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, starring Miko Yu's returning and reprising the role as Dylan Porter, uh, directed by Cecil Laird of The Horror Show. That is crowdfunding on Indiegogo right now, and this is the final week. So get out there and support the film. I think we're at thirty thousand something dollars right now. Our goal is forty. We're going to make it no matter what. Uh, we have enough money to shoot the first scene, so we're going to focus there first. But if we can get it all funded, we can shoot you know the whole short. It's going to be really cool. I mean, this is. You know, Chase Porter, 30 years after the events of everything that happened in New Nightmare, um, and he's dealing with the fact that Freddy's been living in his brain this entire time, weak, but now he's got enough juice to kind of start coming back mm -hmm. out and messing with Chase's life. You know, and to have, you know, an actual actor come back just like Tommy Jarvis, but now take the lead, this is really special. I think this is something that, that Nightmare on Elm Street fans should really gravitate towards. All right, man. That sounds awesome. It's it's great to be in the ground floor of these projects, and it's it's nice to know that you can actually have a hand in getting them out there for everyone to see. So anyway, uh, I'll let you get to your Friday evening. Once again, thanks for uh, being with us today, and maybe we'll do a follow-up in the future uh, after the next one hits. Um, like I said, yep, I'll on. have uh, Vincent's social media links down below posted, and of course there'll be some footage here every now and then uh, of the movies uh, interspersed throughout this interview. So uh, once again, thanks for coming. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, the next interview will be coming up uh, in the not-too-distant future, but until then, this is Genome and Vincent DeSanti. Out. Out.